school and kingdom, school and kingdom. Some schools, Walpole schools, went back this week. It's a strange thing how they go back and then take a break and have a long weekend and then come back. But either way, they started this week. Some schools only start on Tuesday. And I'm not sure which um, grouping you fall in, but it's back to school time. Kids are going back to school. If they like it or not, that's what's happening. But, you know, I heard once that school was a wonderful and amazing thing. Because if it wasn't for school, there would be no school vacations. And the other thing that I heard is that the best day of school is the last day. But I also know that's not true for everybody. Some kids are really excited to get back into the routine, back to their friends, back to, to all the things and the hustle and bustle of learning. But how do you prepare for going back to school? What happens, parents? What happens, kids? What, what are the things that, that, that begin to happen as, as the day approaches? I think the kids know better. Got to start going to bed early. Oh, man. Late nights in summer was good. What else? Some of them start getting anxious. Get school supplies, right? That's a big thing. Go down to Staples or get onto Amazon or wherever you order your school supplies and it's backpacks and what else? Still use pencils? Erasers, shoes, need to get new clothes, right? Folders, notebooks, computers, iPads, I don't know what at all. Modern worlds, what's that? Tablets, right. Get all the modern technology, getting ready for school, and it's no easy task, and it can be a rather pricey task, um, especially if... The kids want, you know, the, the latest shoe that's, that everyone else has, and parents have to negotiate those things. But school is a necessary thing. We all have to learn, and we understand that. But in terms of school and government schools... Sometimes it can be viewed as sending sheep among the wolves. And I know that it's becoming a more and more accurate description of what's happening because of public policy over government schools from, from the White House through to, to different states and different regions. It's, it's, it's different everywhere. So don't, don't just say think that what you hear something in the news about what's happening, say, in Maryland or what's happening in, in Washington or what's happening um, somewhere else, it doesn't mean it's happening in your local school. But it's all driven by a similar public policy. But I want to speak today and say that what we need to do is we need to have a kingdom mindset about what's happening in our schools. And rather than, than, than we can have a couple of ideas, we can withdraw our children from and say they're not going to go to public school, but some people don't have that option. To withdraw them, you can homeschool them. We have homeschooled our children. That's our decision. I'm not trying to say that's what your decision should be. Or you could put them in a private school, a Christian school where, where they're not in, exposed to things that, that are coming down, or we can equip them to be ambassadors for Christ in those places. And that puts a heavy burden on parents because if parents are going to send kids into a place, it doesn't matter where it is, 
they need to prepare them spiritually to be kingdom-minded and ready to be able to speak truth in those difficult places. The question we must ask is, how does my presence, wherever it is, that, that's not just school, but how does my presence at work, how does my presence at, in the store, in the marketplace, how does my presence contribute or bring, contribute to or bring the presence of God in a visible and a tangible way? Because as believers, we are ambassadors for Christ, and where we go, we bring God. And if we go into a, into a perhaps we go into a vacuum where there, where there is no presence of God per se, then, then it is no longer so when we step into that room, when we step into that that platform onto those school grounds and those college campus, wherever it is that we go, we come in and because we showed up, we have brought a tangible presence of God with us. We have brought the kingdom of God to that place. In fact, the kingdom of God has come near because we are there. You see, we choose careers and jobs in view of making a living and sometimes it is in view of making that living in, uh, in the least painful way. Now, of course, I tell you, if you enjoy your job, you won't work a day in your life. But it's true that some days it seems like all work but what we have to do is bring the presence of God into that. We can love our job and make a living, but we can also be in a place where, where things are particularly difficult, but we get to present the Holy Spirit. We get to present God. Think of, of Daniel. I could preach on Daniel today, which, but I'm not. Daniel finds himself with with. Um, the, his other friends and his other mates, they find themselves in Babylon. They found themselves in a place that disregards God, that has no value for the principles that God has put on His people Israel. And they take a stand. And there's times when that stand doesn't, doesn't make any difference. It doesn't, it's not challenged. It's not difficult but there are clearly times as we read through the book of Daniel that they are faced with great difficulty, persecution, and suffering. But I love the book of Daniel because for, for those that we see, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the outcome is wonderful. It is glorious. It is victorious. Oh, but the process was difficult. And that is the challenge that we have in going back to school, in our work environments, in our public spaces, we go to present the kingdom of God. Now, Psalm 127 is a great psalm. I, I love the psalm. I think we can often quote it. And, but listen to it. Let's just read through it. I'm reading from the King James Version. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, 
so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would give us clarity to understand the direction you were giving us in our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have some ideas on going back to school, or some of us go back to work. All the vacationing is over, and it's full steam ahead with that. So if you send your good kids to school every day, um, the one thing we need to know is that and in the family, as for parents, we are to be the greatest influence in our children's lives. We are to be the greatest influence in our children's lives. And some of you might say, well, I don't have children, but, but we, you have access to, to ministry to children children, you have grandchildren, you have, there's a way that you are impacting children's lives. And the family is the greatest influencer for over children today. It can be negative. There are dysfunctional families where, where things fall apart and things don't happen right. But, but for the believer, the family experience should become more and more positive as we grow in God. The home is the first authority structure that a child ever encounters. I just heard this week an alarming report on the fatherlessness of, of the, the world and of our nation and Worldwide, it seems like statistically that 50% of all births, children are born out of wedlock, without a, both a mother and a father. And that is an alarming statistic and a dangerous situation to be. Now, of course, there's some countries that are, that are way off the charts and they have a lot more of it, and there's some that have less. But it's an alarming situation that's happening, and when there is no mother and father in the home, the authority structure is broken down a lot. It's not that mothers can't work hard and don't do a job, a good job in raising children when they find themselves in that situation, but it is not God's best. It is not God's purpose for how families are formed and come together. see, children who grow up without fathers are more likely to engage in risky behaviors, to, to engage in sex early, or to even go to prison and commit crimes. There's a whole long statistics of, of what happens to children who are raised without a father in the home. More likely to commit suicide. More often depressed. Struggle with learning. They don't have an equal opportunity or the support that God intended them to have. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of them and I often complain that there's no prayer in school and I don't know if any of you have ever studied or looked at that, but since they removed prayer from, from school, from that, that moment on, the the crime rate, the drug rate, and everything negative went up and up and up and up and has just been spiraling out of control because prayer in school was a powerful thing, even though it was often a simple prayer or just saying the, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Once that was removed, things began to fall apart. It had impact on the moral values of a nation. But there's a greater concern that we might have today is not that, that there's no school, there's no prayer in schools, but the danger is that there's no prayer in our homes. That is not modeled at home. 
See, we can point fingers at the, at the public structures and say it's not happening, but God would help us that prayer would be something that is practiced regularly. It's often that a situation arises, not like, oh, what are we going to do? How are we going to function? It's like, let's pray about it. And also, we're not going to wait until there's trouble to have prayer as part of our lives. Prayer is a normal part of our living in a home structure. See, we have to build the Christian values that we can decry that are missing in the public arena. We have to build them in that first home family structure. Because if children are going to survive in, in, a, in, a, in a more and increasingly hostile and secularized world, they have to go armed with that which will make it possible for them to live strong and to be kingdom ambassadors. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 9. We know these words so well, and this is, this is from the message version. It says, Love God, God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that is in you. Love Him with all you got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk to them whatever, wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and your foreheads as a reminder Inscribe them on your door, the doorposts of your homes and on your city gates. That, I know it's Old Testament. I know it's Deuteronomy. But that is good advice. Can you say that? That's good advice. That, that, that's something positive that we can do in this world, we can, we can make a mark of telling our children the things of God. I've heard too many times where parents might say, not parents here, but where you, you, you hear what's going on, they say, well, well, I don't want to indoctrinate my kids. I want them to make up their own mind. Well, that's a foolish, that's such a foolish thing. Train your child from young. Teach them from when they are from birth the things of God. That they will have them inscribed in their heart. That they will practice them and know them for sure. The message of truth and life has got to be ours as parents before we can pass it on. It's got to be real to us before we be able to give it to our children. And when we don't own it, when we don't own a faith that is robust, that calls on God first, that seeks God first, that's in the Word, that's in prayer, that's, that, that is consistent there in worshiping God, then we don't have anything to impart. What we do have is religion. And that's a form without substance. And that is a dangerous thing. Second Timothy 3.5 talks about, about holding a form of outward godliness, which is religion, although they have denied its power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. Avoid such people and keep far away from them. That's the amplified version. Now, we don't like to talk about where the Bible says avoid people and keep away from them. But, but for us as believers, we have, to, we have to embrace these things and say, no, we're not going to hold a form of godliness. We're not just going to talk about 
church on Sunday. We're not just going to talk about God on Sunday or when it's convenient or when the wheels fall off of the cart, but we're going to talk about God every day from the morning until the night. We're going to declare His wonders. We're going to speak of His goodness because what matters for us is that, is that our children will know that that which we say we believe in, they know it is true. They have something that they can see is true in us. See, the power of faith is that God, of our faith as Christians, is that God is personal and He is involved. Do you know that? That God is personal. He gets right into your business and He wants to be involved in your life in every area. And, and it, is, it is so human to want God uninvolved in some parts of our lives and have Him heavily involved in other parts. And sometimes we'll invite Him in when we have trouble. But God is actually waiting for an invitation to be invited in to every part of our lives. You see, we have, the, we have Jesus standing at the door and He's knocking and He says that if a man will open, if someone will open that door, I will come in with them and I will have fellowship with them. If we will open up, God is looking for the invitation to come in. And when He comes in, He doesn't just want to come into the living room. He wants to come into the whole house. And that's why we don't often want to let Him in. We want to say, Lord, You can come in but you're restricted to the dining room. You're, restrict, you're restricted to the living room. Or, or maybe you can come as far as the porch, but you cannot come in. Let Him in today, because that changes from where well, what we have is, is, a, is a shallow religion without relationship. That is not going to help our children or the next generation get a hold of God. See, Mark 7, 13 is, is one of those crazy scriptures that, 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 that twists my mind when I think about it. It says, Jesus is speaking to, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious rulers. He says, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you, that you have handed down. Let us not have tradition that is not based in substance and in truth. Because that sometimes, that will just nullify the Word of God. We will run with the tradition and not follow the Word. And that's a dangerous place to be. See, when our faith just becomes a list of do's and don'ts. Don't do that! You can do this, but you can't do that. You can go there, but you can't go there. when it moves from just that list of things that we shouldn't do, behaviors that we should avoid, and it doesn't have relationship, it's going to cause trouble and rebellion in the hearts of so many. It'll breed distrust. Come on, kids, you know that's true. Right? It's a hard thing for a parent. Sometimes we, we turn around and say to our kids, do this, and they say... But why? And when we run out of the reason, good reasons, we say, do it because I said so. Any parent ever done that? Come on. Sometimes we just, we just revert to the, the authoritarian position. I said so, so do it. Sometimes that's necessary, but let that not be our only position. Let it come from a relationship. Because if we simply are the authoritarian, you do what I say, you do when I say it and how I say it, and that's the rule of the house, and there's no relationship, we're going to build rebellion and resentment. We're going to create distance between us and our children who are, who are going out into dangerous territory every day. You see, God is in charge. Amen? 
God is rules and reigns over us, but He loves us. He hasn't left us. He hasn't moved away and said, oh, well, you're all on your own. You see, at home, parents are in charge under God. And we know it. We know that's the way it is. But we also know that it's possible for parents to be at home, in the home, and distant from their kids. It's possible. Nowadays, parents work so hard. They work long hours. They wait from home a lot. Parents are trading off here and there. Kids go to um, kindergarten, preschool, and, and um, take up child care from a very early age. And the parents are out of the home because that seems to be the standard and what society demands. But, but even if a parent is at home, you can be distant from your children Now imagine that if we're distant and we don't have a close relationship with our children, it's like trying to teach them to ride a bicycle over Zoom. Right? Not a good idea. They need somebody to stabilize. They need somebody to, 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 to help them get going. You can put those training wheels on, but, but somebody has to take those training wheels off and help them make the first move to balance and to pedal and to get around the corners without cracking their skull open, right? Proverbs 22 verse 6 tells us that you train a child in the way that he should go and when he's old, he will not turn from it. That really means, in, in, the, in the Hebrew, means train a child to what he's bent. We have to look at our children and say, well, what, what are the characteristics that God has put in them? How has God wonderfully and beautifully formed them and made them? What, what has God poured into them? And what is coming out? And then we train them according to those things. We, we let that which God has, has deposited into them, let that shine. Find the bent and train them in their own unique way. But we need to be involved. We, we don't... Um, we want to steer, we want to guide, we want to encourage, we want to develop, but we don't want to stand back. Another thing that, parent, that drives kids crazy, the kids can, can tell me about that, is that, that if, if, when you start comparing one kid to another, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your sister? Why can't you be more like your neighbor or your cousin? Because I'm just like you, Mom. Just like you, Dad. That's why. No, I don't, I don't suggest that, that you say that to your parents, but, but sometimes the things that irritate us most in our kids are the qualities that, that are found in our very selves. The things that we struggle to, to notice in our children are the things that trip us up sometimes. Not all the time. The Bible warns us about comparing ourselves to people. Our only comparison, the only worthwhile comparison is how do we measure up to Christ? What is it? Oh yeah, we all fall short. We all fall short, but it is that that is what we want to attain. To. We want to attain to, to the standard of Christ. We want to attain to the standard that God has set before us. That is, what we, that is our mark. That is what is worked work, working toward. Another thing that we can do as parents, and it needs to happen, children need to be involved in this, is we need to have dialogue in the home. We need to talk about what's going on. Now, I'm not a talker. I'm, 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 a, I'm a silent kind. I just want to be, you know what? I don't want to talk about things when I don't have to talk about them. But we have to give our child, children opportunities to talk. And sometimes we need to draw it out of them. 
And then we need to be good listeners. Listen to what they're saying. Hear what is also behind the words. Let them express their, their thoughts and their feelings and their, and, and their doubts and their discouragements. Hear what they're saying. And then prayerfully ask God how to encourage them along the way. But I have to say to, to the kids going to school, talk to your parents. Right? If your parents won't encourage that talk, then, then don't bottle up and say, oh, well, okay, my parents don't want to listen to me, they don't want to talk. After today, the they'll listen to you, but perhaps you need to do some of the talking as well. See, when I was growing up, um, at the time there was this debate going on about quality versus quantity time. And the, the, the standard was there, there was people were saying, well, well, if parents just can give their children quality time, that's all that's needed. Because parents obviously don't have the quantity of time that they used to have. Things have changed. But given many years later, the statistics and the professionals and the smart people say children need both. They don't just need quality time. They actually need time of both sorts. Not just where you're in the room with them for hours and hours and hours. That's quantity. But where you're in the room with them for hours and hours and you're doing and engaging with them in those times. Children need and thrive in both. We might have to be in tune with what's going on in our children's lives. What's being taught at school. I find it fascinating that though my children aren't in public school, I try to find out what is being taught in public schools. And, and public schools, though they are public, the curriculums they teach are not. Perhaps the teachers can tell me where to find them. But it's not like a public, a public school publishes and says, these are our textbooks. This is what we're teaching. This is what it is. You find out, I guess, and I can be corrected, that when your child comes home with the textbooks or the work, then you know what textbooks and things they're using. But it is, we need to be able to investigate on one level or another, even if it is just from our children, engage with them about what they're learning. Broach the topics. Ask them, what do they enjoy? What do they dread about school? What's going on? Ask them about, about what's happening in the relationships with, within school. Are they, are they having friends? Are they alone? Are they being bullied? Are they being pushed aside? Have those discussions. Children need to know that the parents want to be involved. They might not always want you involved. Now, I'm the kind of parent that if my kid would say, well, you know, there's a bully at school, I'd say, show him to me. Right? That would be my first reaction. Not necessarily what I'd follow through, but it's like, how dare you? How can you do that? We have to ask them about hot topics, difficult things that maybe we're not comfortable talking about because, unfortunately, those are the topics they talk with their friends in the halls and the lunchrooms and on the playgrounds. And in some cases, those are the topics that they hear from teachers in school. We have to be sure, if we can't be the first, we have to at least have the last say on these difficult things. Parents need to talk to their kids about the truth about alcohol and drugs. Don't let them just hear it from school. 
I don't know how often we hear these days that, that a child died of an overdose of fentanyl, then we think, well, maybe, maybe they, were, they, were, they were using the drug on a long time. Oh, no, it comes out that it was a first try. It was a first experiment that they, that, that they were going to, to participate in, but they took too much and ended their life. Those stories are all too common today. The world is a dangerous place. Psalm 78 verse 4 tells us what we should do with the things that God is working in our lives and how we should. It, 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 it's the same and similar to what we heard in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7. This is also the verse that we use for our children's ministry at All Nations Worship Center. Psalm 78 4. We will not hide these truths, the truths of God's Word. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. Let's talk to our children about that though there are all these terrible things out in the world, there is a God who is able to do mighty, wonderful things, who is able to come and, and work in someone's life to preserve their life, to protect them, and to strengthen them no matter what's happening. already said that, that there needs to be, though we can decry the fact that prayer is out of schools, but there needs to be prayer at home. We need to pray with our children. Pray about tests. Pray about difficult situations, relationships that they have with, with, with kids at school that, that are odd, that are difficult, that are good. Pray about them all. Include them in prayer. A large part of what I want to share with you today comes from Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1 through 27. It's an entire chapter. But, but here is a father's advice to, to his son and to his children. And listen to, to what it says here. It says, My children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment. For I'm giving you good guidance. Do not turn away from my instructions. For I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom. Develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head. My child, listen to me, and do as I say and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's ways and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back, and when you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Don't do as the wicked do. And don't follow the paths of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving. For evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deed for the day. They can't rest until they've caused someone to stumble. They eat the food of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. The way of, a righteous, of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn which shines ever brighter until the full day. But the way of the wicked is total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. 
Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. And verse 27, don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. There's a lot of good advice in there. Straight from the Word of God. Ancient advice that is practical and relevant for today. But in all this, our children need encouragement. Well, parents need encouragement too, right? We need a little bit of encouragement somewhere along the way because it's not easy to be a parent. Sometimes, in fact, it is so hard to be a parent. But we need encouragement along the way. And I believe that God wants to encourage us by, by, when, by getting into His Word and into the things that, that build the character, that build the resilience and the strength that we need to manage and live in our time. See, there are, neg- there are enough negative forces in the world and we must find the positives and fo- focus on them with our kids. They need to see, we need to see, parents and children need to see that there is hope. That there is, that there is a way out. That there is another way. Because we can talk about how terrible the world is. We can talk about the global warming or, or climate trouble. And then the, what happens is our children are, are having all kinds of anxieties and taking medication because they're afraid that the world's going to end. We can, talk about, we can talk about the troubles that there are in our world and the violence that there is and the, and the difficulties that people face. We can talk about the troubles in our government. But the, the one thing is that we must talk about as much if not more. We must talk about the positive things that God is able, as we sang this morning, to, to overcome and do the impossible. That God is able and He is working to bring about His kingdom in the earth. That we're not just simply sitting back and saying, oh, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. But we're saying, no! God is at work and God is able. He will keep me. He will preserve me. He will protect me. And I know that because His Word says so. Our kids belong to God. We belong to God. Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16 says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. My frame was not hidden from you. I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God has a plan for your life. We just finished the series where we said that, that there's a race that He set before us and we have to run it. And last week we looked at, at what, what, what happens when, when we don't follow that path, then all kinds of trouble and all things begin to fall apart. But when we follow the path, we understand that God has... has ordained a way for us to walk and live, we can be encouraged because He has the outcome. He's there not to bring us destruction, but to bring us an expectant hope, a hope and a future. Something that we can depend on and trust. You see, when you don't have God in your life, then all the the bad news of our, our current world will frighten and scare you and and make you think, oh, it's a terrible time to be alive. But let me tell you, you are living at the best time that you could possibly be, be living because God put you here for a purpose. That's just not for the kids only. That's for each one of us. It's here. But I want to say that as school goes back with 
With school comes all kinds of other things. There, there, there's a lot of pressure of learning. There's a lot of homework. There's a lot of study that has to happen. There, there are things that, that, that kids have to do that keep them really, really busy. And then add on to extracurricular activities that, that are there that are beneficial for, for our physical fitness, for, for developing skills, for, for leadership qualities. There are all these things that are available to us in this time and in this world that, that are truly valuable for our children. But let us be sure that not everything that is simply good for them is most important that they do it. There has to be a drawing of the line and a priority in what we'll do. See, there's a lot of pressure. I read an article where today the pressure on children participating in extracurricular activities of all kinds, there's a great pressure on them because that is where the scholarships are. That is where they, they, how they get into the next great college. That is how they find their future and that determines where they're going. Don't let that be your governing factor. Let God be your governing factor. And so as we go back to school, let us make sure that we're also going back to church. Let us make sure that that, 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 is, that is a standard. If we, if we simply say, well, you know what, sport, extracurricular, and other activities are, are a higher priority than being in the house of God, then we've got it the wrong way around. Because there's nothing more important than our spiritual development. There's nothing more important than growing in, in a community with each other in the presence of God. People might say, and some of you have said it to me before, well, Pastor, it's because you don't like sport, that's why you speak about it. Well, let me just be honest and straightforward. It's not that I don't like sport. I dislike the competition between sport and God. I dislike the competition between extracurricular activities and, the, and being in the house of God. I have a problem with where one is before the other. God always should, must, and in terms of whatever we do in life, God must come first. I know there's challenges to people today in, in the work environment. You get brought into work. I don't think I'm speaking out of term and saying my son took a promotion at work and ever since he's taken the promotion at work, they've hammered him on all kinds of things and so often they pull him into work on Sunday. Even though he stated the situation. It's one thing when it's pressure and you cannot get out of it. It's another thing when it is willful, when it is something we do because we want to or it's just trying to make a little extra. I think we need to trust God for our priorities. And that does not saying that you can't work on Sundays. It's between you and God but it is a matter of what will we do. Because if we don't show our children that we own the priority of God first, they will think that God is not, or church is not necessary. In fact, it is unnecessary. In fact, it is something that doesn't matter when we don't prioritize things that should be our priorities, children can easily consider them less important even than we claim them to be. But when it comes to, to, to our kids, we can, we can look at things, we can look at our families, we can look at the time in which we live, but Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, 
is a verse that, that I think is so important for us when it comes to living in the world in which we live. This is a verse that, that, will, that speaks to me because I need this. In living in all the pressures and the difficulties and the, and the current atmosphere that, that is in the world, this will help. And he says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And what we have to find is we have to find joy in God. We have to find our joy in the Lord. We have to find our joy in serving God. So that when we go into the world, we don't walk into the world downcast, down with our faces down, with our heads down. And we, we, we go in there and we're just miserable because we're, we're walking about and life is difficult. We can go and know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. How will we cope in a difficult environment, in a difficult situation? We will cope by putting God first. And when we do, the joy that we find in Him will give us strength in every situation. He, and His strength, I tell you, I'd rather have the power and the strength and the might of God behind me than my own strength, my own actions, or even the actions and the strength of a large crowd. I'd rather have God on my side and everybody be against me than the backing of many but not God. You know, in John chapter 6, verse 66 and 68, um, there's a time when, when disciples saw many of many people leave and, and, and sort of walk away from Jesus at a time because he spoke some hard words that they couldn't understand. And he said, it says, from that time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, you don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. But Simon Peter, of course he answers first, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. In a time when, when in record numbers people might be walking away from God, this is our question. This is where we must stand and say, Lord, though everybody walk away, where will we go? Where can we go? Because you alone have the words of eternal life. And we believe that you alone are God. And I end with this scripture. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Reading it from the message because it gives it just in, in, out of the terms where we, where we can simply quote it and not hear it. Joshua 24, verse 14 through 15. So now, fear God, worship Him in total commitment, get rid of the gods your ancestors worshipped, on the far side of the river, Euphra the river, that's the Euphrates. And in Egypt, you worship. And in Egypt, if you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. I've always puzzled. Really? Did... Did Joshua say that? Is that? Was that God's word through Joshua? Yes, that was God said. God would rather have you in some ways make a hard and fast decision to serve God or not serve Him. But to be firm in your decision. If you decide that it's a bad thing to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshipped from the country beyond the river, or one of the gods of the Amorites, 
on whose land you are now living. And of course, he has the, the crux of all that he's saying. As for me and my family, we will worship God. Now going back to school and going back into all the swing of things, that has to be, that should be, that hopefully is our standard. As for me and my house, we will worship. We will serve God. We will not, cave. We will not be pressured into anything else. We'll worship God. But that worship of God begins in the home, it begins in the church, and it spreads from, from those places to, to our environment, to our society, to where we go. It begins with a decision. You see, it is your call. It is my call. But unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. I don't want <coughs> that to be the case for us. I don't want that to be the case for our children. I don't want that to be, <coughs> <coughs> to be the case for the next generation. But that we'll stand as strong families, we'll stand as, as, as children and say, yes, we will serve the Lord. We will grab a hold of God in our youth. We will grab a hold of God in, in our tender years. We will grab a hold of God as we, as we grow and as we develop and as, as, as things begin to happen. We will get a hold of God and say, I will serve Him. And I'll serve Him alone. I don't want anyone to choose to serve another God. To serve the God of your ancestors. To serve a God who is not a God at all. No one. I don't want that from you and I don't want that for you. But I would have you, I would encourage you that today we make a firm decision that as for me and my family, my house, we will serve the Lord. If you can make that decision and that <coughs> choice today, will you stand with me? We will we'll, we'll make that decision. We'll firm it before the Lord. We'll present ourselves and our children and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you're here with, with your children today, just, just gather them close to you. Put, take them off the pew, put your hands on them, parents, and make that declaration that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will declare the Lord. And if you're, if you're here today and you, and, and you don't have someone standing with you, you don't have children, find someone that you know in the church is standing alone and go stand with them because there are families, there are, there are, there are people crying out and saying, my children are lost, my children don't serve the Lord, my children are, are missing. But what I want to do is I want to declare with them, I want to stand with them and make this, this solid decision today that my family will serve the Lord. Not in compromise, not in failure, not in under the pressures that the world gives, but under the presence and in the presence of God. Father, we pray today as families stand together, Lord, and as hands are laid on children, and children stand there holding hands with their parents, Lord, I pray for these families. I pray for those who are, are watching or listening to this this sermon today, Lord, and in the living rooms and in the cars and wherever they are, Lord, where they cry out for their families, I pray, Lord, that You would hear the prayers. Lord, You would hear the prayers. I pray, Father, first of all, that You would strengthen fathers in the home. Lord, give fathers a resolve to serve You like never before. Give, give fathers a strong faith. Lord, give them a desire to, to, to grow in their faith and not just say, well, I, I don't have to do it. I don't have to be that strong. I've never been that strong. Lord, I pray, Lord, that You would speak to the fathers in the homes today. That You would rise up, raise up godly men. 
in this day that they would stand up, they would stand firm, they would stand strong, and they would deliver the Word of the Lord to their homes. Lord, I pray for the mothers. Lord, that You would that with the tenderness that You have given, and that with the understanding that You have given, Lord, with, with the way that they, they just love their children, Lord, I pray that with the tenderness, Lord, in them, You would have them also make a resolve that they will serve You and they would show the love of God to their family. They would show the love of God to their children, Lord, and they would show the love of God to their grandchildren. Lord, they would demonstrate Father that You are a God who loves, who is merciful, who is tender and kind and, and gentle. Lord, they would do that. And Lord, they would come with a boldness that only a mother can have toward their children. Lord, I pray for the children who are going back to school, some who have gone, for those who are at college, and Lord, those who are are all over the place. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that You would cause our children to get a hold of God in such a way, Lord, that their relationship will be strong, that their relationship will, will be powerful. Lord, that they would love You with their whole heart, soul, and mind. And Father, that even when they go into the difficult situations and they have to navigate difficult places in school or in public, wherever they find themselves, Lord, give them a resolve to say, I will serve God. And Lord, that they will not compromise. They will not give in. But Lord, they will have a firm, solid foundation. Lord, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord, that, that when the flute plays, when the music comes, Lord, when the command is there, that they should bow, that they should do the thing that everyone is doing. They would say, no, I will not bow to the idols. I will not bow to the things that they say. And Lord, even if they stand alone, give them the courage to stand. Lord, I pray for a hedge to be around the families today. Lord, I know that, that there are many ways that, that the families are being invaded and being attacked. But Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that Your hand would rest upon the families today in, in giving them strength in protecting, Lord, in giving wisdom, Lord, even the wisdom of the, of the Proverbs that we read today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, it would, be, it would be the grounding principle in each home that You are God. And Lord, that Your Word is wise. Your Word is accurate. Your Word is able to instruct and to deliver and to raise a generation of strong young people. Lord, I pray that You give courage to Your people, young and old. Lord, we know that today we need courage. Lord, and I pray that You would give us courage to be Your children, Your ambassadors, Your kingdom people in this world. And I thank You in Jesus' name. Lord, that You hear our prayers. Lord, that you, that you touch lives. I pray for anointing to come upon families. Lord, like never before. Lord, every one of those, these homes, Lord, let them be anointed. Lord, as if with oil, as if with the presence of God. Lord, let them be protected as if, as if, as if with blood blood on the doorpost, Lord, that, that, that which, which the enemy devises for evil will not pass their doorways. Lord, that You would come in and that, Lord, You would fill those homes with Your presence and all that is not of You will be cast out, will be thrown out. Lord, the house will, houses will be cleaned, Lord, spiritually speaking and naturally speaking. Lord, that they, would, that they would be pure before You, that there would be a holy ground. Lord, it would be a safe place to be in the hands of God under the protection of Your Spirit and Your presence. Thank You, Father. Lord, I pray for, for those, for parents, Lord, who are under so much pressure, Lord, to provide and 
and to function and to do and to win in the world today. But Lord, I pray that you would give them peace today. Lord, that, that the anxiety that parents have over their children, Lord, that they would, you would pour peace into them today. Lord, that you would comfort their hearts when they cry before you. And Lord, say, I don't know what's happening in the world. I don't know about the future of my children. Lord, you are the future of the next generation. Lord, pour your strength upon them. Give them hope. Let them know that you are the God of hope that gives a future. And Lord, for the children who, who hear all the, the negative talk and all the evil of this day, and Lord, their hearts want to fail. Their hearts want to give in. They just want to say, what's the point? What's the use? Father, give them hope. Lord, that they might be in school and they will speak of our hope that you have given them. Lord, that they can give an account to the hopeless of the hope that they have received from You. Thank You, Father. Lord, that You are doing amazing things. And Lord, now bless Your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. God bless You. What an awesome opportunity just to pray and stand together and make declarations that in this place, and over these people, God is the one who is in charge. May the Lord bless you, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Tuesday night. Greet each other as you leave.